Welcome to City Church. We are a biblically based, relationally driven, spirit led church, encouraging everyone to follow Jesus, grow together, and serve others. We're excited to share this sermon with you today, and you can always find out more about us online at citychurchseville.com. Would you uh, stand with me as we prepare to recite the Lord's Prayer? as we normally do on Sunday mornings. It should be up behind us. I hope it is because I'm going to recite it with you. This then is how you should pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth in Charlottesville as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. Please have a seat. We are in this new series, while well, Pastor Pete actually begun the series a week or so ago, on the pastoral epistles, the letters that were written by Paul to Timothy and Titus. And the focus of the series is on relationships. And... Um, Embedded in our passage today, Titus chapter 3, is this notion of doing good. Doing good finds its impulse upon God's kindness and love, which in turn moves us toward good and healthy relationships within the church and beyond to all others. One thing to be reminded about the author, Paul, is that he was very committed to mission and to a church that was devoted to truth and to relationships growing with one another. And this does come clearly, come out clearly in, the, in this chapter, in this letter uh, to Titus, who was given charge over the churches of Crete. So Paul had become aware that there are some problems in Crete, in the Cretan church. Um, within it, there were people that were advocating for ideas and rituals um, that threatened to subvert the plain teaching of the gospel. Paul encountered these folks in other places, notably in Galatians, and these were uh, Jewish believers who had a difficult time letting go of um, certain traditions and practices, traditions like, or, or laws of the dietary nature and practices such as circumcision. And to fellow Jews, maybe this was not such a problem, but to non-Jews, the Gentiles who are growing in the population in the church, this was a problem because the, the traditional Jewish Christians were imposing these, um, these traditions and practices and rituals and, um, and holding, up, holding these things up as criteria for what it means to be a true follower of Jesus. Paul was adamant about correcting this situation. Um, it's also important to remember that these are Cretans. How many of us have heard that word? How many of us have used that term uh, about someone else? Well, it, it has ancient roots. And uh, in fact, let me read from, uh, I don't have this on a slide, but I, I just kind of thought of it. But uh, in Titus chapter 1, um, Paul wrote in, let's begin with verse 10. Um, For there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, um, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not gain. Even one of their own prophets, Epimetides, said... Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true, says Paul. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. Even one of their own, a known, uh, a known poet, Epimenides, said of his own people that Cretans are liars. And so... Uh, this is an important uh, piece of information to know that um, we, Paul is writing to Titus, who has been given charge over the church, the house churches in Crete. And some of that was being imported, and some of the problems that were being stirred up was because we had these Jewish um, folks who were 
still committed to their um, traditions, but also um, they, were, they took on some, some of the Cretan flavor as well. Well, by way of setting the table, let's read now um, Titus 1, 1 through 4, because uh, here Paul tells us why he is writing to Titus. So he wrote, this letter is from Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I've been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. This truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, by the way, this is an, a jab to the Cretans, the God who does not lie, because their favorite God was Zeus. And they believed that Zeus uh, was actually born on Crete and died on Crete, which is strange because Zeus was a god who was not supposed to die. And, and they were also very proud of um, telling tales about Zeus and tales of, in fact, his unscrupulous ways, the way he deceived people to gain what he wanted in relationships and all that. And so, therefore, uh, Paul is saying, God is the God who does not lie, unlike your God. And so, this truth, he gives him confidence for eternal life, which was promised before the world began. And now, at just the right time, he has revealed his, this message, which, which we announce to everyone. It is by the command of God our Savior that I have been entrusted with this work for him. I'm writing to Titus, my true son in the faith, that we share. May the God and May the God, the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Savior, give you grace and peace. So Paul gives this, um, Titus instructions about what are faithful communities. And he begins in the first part of the letter with households, talking about the appropriate ways that Christians are to behave within Christian households and leaders and such. In fact, he wanted, um, he's asking Titus to appoint certain leaders of certain quality to help actually combat the problem in the Cretan church. So people who are full of faith and, and people who are mature in faith and these kinds of things, people who had good relationships at home and outside of home. So Paul begins in the household, and then we come to chapter 3 where he expands that out. We zoom out to the way that Christians, believers, ought to behave to the broader community. So let's read Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Remind believers to submit to the government and its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. They must not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show true humility to everyone. Paul begins by saying that believers ought to submit to the government and its officers. Now, I know that's fraught with all kinds of things, and, and we think about where we are today, and we wonder, really? Does Paul really mean that? He absolutely means that, and Paul was writing at a time when it was actually kind of dangerous to, um, to live under Roman, the Roman rule, Roman Empire, because the emperors were pretty capricious. They, you know, you know, from one to the next, you didn't know what you were going to get. But yet Paul recognizes that the governing structures are, are from God, are established by God. Romans chapter 13 reads like this. Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes too for these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. How many of us in this room 
work for the government and can say amen to that. For government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to workers what need to be paid. Um, I'm sorry, give to um, everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. This is a hard saying of Paul, and it falls on um, um, uh, uh, really hard times in our day. But what Paul is saying here is that the appropriate way for Christians to behave, even in terms of how we um, are disposed toward our governments and our officials, the appropriate way for Christians to behave is counterculturally. This is not an advocacy on Paul's part for weakness and, and keeping a low profile and not being noticed by the government. But this is actually a call by the Apostle Paul to obey God because it is God that establishes governing structures for the good of all people. And Christians are marked by the way that we behave, even toward our government. Yeah, we can complain about taxes and, and government and all that. It's, it's, it's fine to hold different opinions about these things, but it is not good to be um, subversive and to uh, not carry the character of Christ when we are relating ourselves to it. Okay, so let's move on from this. Uh, there's a whole lot that can be said. In fact, we have a workshop coming up in August, um, a cohort actually that I'm leading on how we are meant to relate to politics as believers. And uh, there'll be some announcement and some opportunity to sign up for that cohort uh, in the coming weeks. All right, so Paul now, he says that we are an appropriate way for believers to behave is to not engage in slander. And the Greek word is blasphemeo. What does that sound like? Blaspheme. And the, this verb means to, um, to do damage, to injure the reputation of someone, to defame someone. We are not to be people who are engaged in defaming and doing um, damage to another person's reputation. Let their reputation speak for themselves. We are not to engage in that. And Paul also says that we must avoid quarreling or contentiousness. We must avoid contentiousness. Now, I know something about contentiousness. I do. You know, driving... I think it's meant to be a fairly pleasant experience. I mean, it gets us from one place to the next, from home to church, to the grocery store. Uh, even, even a pleasant experience in, in uh, the countryside, taking a nice road trip. Um, but as you know, that is not always the case. And that pleasantness when you get in the car and head out is interrupted by that other driver. <laughs> Do you know that most people believe that they are good drivers? <laughs> I mean, I think I'm a good driver, but that's a matter of opinion, I suppose. But, um, and it's not just me. But what are we to do in, when we are in a, in a moment of contentiousness? Because I can tell you the truth about me. And that is, I don't always get behind a wheel hoping for a pleasant experience. Actually, more often than not, I am loading up for bear. <laughs> when I get behind a wheel, I'm ready, you know, and, uh, and uh, I need my disposition. God reminds me. So what do I do? What, what is good to do, right? We, there's all kinds of things. Uh, turn up. Uplifting music in the car, you know. Um, maybe worship music, praise music, or something very positive. Um, one thing not to do is to exacerbate this, the moment by provoking, by using provocative words or actions. Um, offer a prayer. <laughs> I, some of you are filling in the blanks on the words and the actions. <laughs> That's okay. Um, 
Pete talks about having a sanctified imagination. Um, so, but we can offer up a prayer for the other driver, or we can realize that everybody has a backstory. One of my favorite bumper stickers, I got behind a person, and, and this driver was not, you know, they were driving just nicely, but their bumper sticker, I think it was a woman behind the wheel, uh, said, please be patient. You know how there's, please be patient with me, I'm a student driver or something like that? Um, this one said, please be patient with me, I'm dumb. <laughs> I thought, okay, I'll, I'll give you that. You, you go ahead, you know. And um, I love the honesty, but you know, people have a backstory, right? And we all do. And sometimes people are having a bad day and they're behind the wheel. And you know, you know, the other thing is, and this is serious, that be aware that there are people who live with, um, with um, issues that, that need medication. And, and they may be off or they may be on a, you know, they may be depressed, they may be manic. And uh, be aware that, that we have those realities that are among us and, and people um, live with these kinds of things. But basically what we are called to be in this world is like Jesus, who said of himself that he is gentle and lowly. But why? Why should we? Well, Paul gives us a rationale in the next session in Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. He said, Once we too were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us not because of the righteous things we'd done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. It's important that we are reminded that we were all falling short. And for some of us, it was a serious and painful way. But in so remembering, we gaze upon the Ebenezer stones of our lives. The Ebenezer stone is called the stone of help from 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. When the prophet Samuel erected one as a memorial to God's actions of help and deliverance from the Philistine army. When we are reminded of God's kindness and love, as Paul is advocating for in this section, we then are empowered to do what is good. So it's important that we, we set up memorials in our lives to remind us of God's goodness and loving kindness. And when we do that on a regular basis, this is practicing, by the way, gratitude. When we practice gratitude, when we look upon God's goodness and loving kindness in our own lives and in the lives of those that we care about, I, I believe that this can be an anecdote, uh, antidote to contentiousness and blaspheme and all these kinds of things and moves us toward being people who are good in the way that Jesus is good. Then Paul kind of reiterates in the next section of his letter. He, reiter he visits again this issue of um, the problems in the church. We read, do not get involved in foolish discussions about spiritual pedigrees or in quarrels and fights about obedience to Jewish laws. These things are useless and a waste of time. If people are causing divisions among you, give a first and second warning. After that, have nothing to do with them. For people like that have turned away from the truth and their own sins condemn them. Paul is telling us to not engage in these, these useless kinds of arguments. And he's telling them that for sure. Oh, by the way, I, I, failed, I probably failed to mention this, but you know, we are taking a peek into Paul's correspondence to Titus. We are outsiders looking in. And you've probably heard it said from here that scripture is written for us but not to us. 
And, and that helps us hold space for the fact that there's a context, um, historical, cultural, um, literary, um, and, and customs, and all that kind of thing. So when we read scripture, we, we must always be aware that we are, we are outsiders looking in. It's not that the scripture doesn't have great benefit for us. It does, but it's our job to study and to sort of, you know, discern by the work of the Spirit in us how Scripture applies to us. So I just wanted to mention that. So um, Paul is addressing this, again, specifically about the Jewish problem in the church. He says these things, these arguments, these discussions, it's just really important to know that, and shocking, actually, that Paul is saying these are useless things because he himself advocated for these very kinds of things when he, before he, before he responded to Jesus' call on his life. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was very committed to the very things he's saying now are destructive to Christian community. And, and so serious, he said, that those who are creating division, those who are stirring up strife in the church, they are to be confronted. They are to be, um, they, there's a due process, warn them, Twice, and if they, if they re, um, resist, then have nothing to do with them. That seems harsh, but this only highlights the importance of, of maintaining and protecting the integrity of the gospel and the people of the gospel, the community of faith. It's serious business when people try to, out of their own motivations, um, create division and cause ruin in the church. A young rabbi found a serious problem in his new congregation. During the Friday service, half the congregation stood for prayers, and the other half remained seated. And each, each side shouted at each other, insisting that theirs was a true tradition. Well, nothing the rabbi said or did helped solve the impasse. Finally, in desperation, he sought out the 99-year-old founder of the synagogue. He met the old rabbi in the nursing home and poured out his troubles. So tell me, he pleaded, was it the tradition for the congregation to stand during the prayers? No, answered the old rabbi. Ah, responded the younger man. Then was it the tradition to sit during the prayers? No, answered the rabbi. Well, the young rabbi responded, what we have is complete chaos. Half the people stand and shout, the other half sit and scream. Ah, said the older rabbi, that was the tra tradition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a funny illustration, and we, and thankfully, we are not that at City Church, and not to my knowledge. We do not have shouting matches, and, and we don't have that kind of division, and I'm thankful for that. And, and while we are not people in uniformity of thought and beliefs and ideologies, we do gather around the things. We are in unity around the things that matter the most. I think about when we worship together, as we do on Sunday mornings like this morning. Um, we don't, all of us, we, we don't all express ourselves in the same way in worship, but all of us do sense the Spirit of God during the worship, during those powerful moments. Or I think about the way in which City Church has committed itself to serving our city. Um, we began with City Church, uh, City Serve on weekends, and now we are we are growing in our um, in, in the opportunities that we have always in front of us to serve our cities. And these are the kinds of things that matter. And these are the kinds of things I think that we are gathered about. And I'm right now. I'm going to invite the worship team back up here. In my concluding remarks, I'd like to say, but the fact is, <clears throat> you know, setting aside the faraway situation in a faraway country at a faraway time, we find ourselves not so different, don't we? We wrestle with the same impulses and feelings that well up inside us, feelings of contentiousness, argumentativeness, even slander. We bring our relationships to the brink of disaster because 
we need to be right, or at least seem to be right. The matters over which we quarrel are varied. Politics, religion, worship styles, climate change, etc. And these are not in, unimportant issues, and it's okay to have opinions about this thing or that. But Paul's admonition is crystal clear. We are not to advance our opinions and beliefs in such a way as to damage people and relationships and in a manner that casts shadow upon the gospel we profess. And why do we give in to these impulses to be right, even if it costs us so much? There are many reasons which differ from one person to the next. The simple truth is that we are all broken in some form or another that impacts our sense of self and significance. Sometimes politics and religion or this cause or that cause compete to fill those gaps in those broken places. But the gaps can only and should only be filled with our new identity in Jesus. The apostle gives us real and meaningful hope when in the letter to the church of Rome, he stated confident, confidently that we are united to Christ through sharing in his baptism and rising up out of those waters to new life. Or to the church in Corinth, he boldly asserted that believers, by the power of the Holy Spirit, are in the process of being made new if we would be responsive to the Spirit's work. Paul uses the word metamorphosis to describe the process, much like the transformation of a caterpillar to a butterfly. There's uh, hopefully a, a slide of uh, books I, I think are worth reading. Um, there they are. And I want you to take note, I think that these are very helpful in addressing what we are talking about today. Um, not up there is uh, honorable mention is um, the Bible Project. I, I commend that to you. Uh, just watch the videos on the various different books and thoughts. Um, I, these are really helpful in helping us understand scripture and helping us apply scripture to our lives. We have folks here this morning that will be ready to pray for you and to hear um, what you want to share with them and to, to offer um, whatever it is that's heavy on your heart, please let them carry that burden with you. So let's pray. Our gracious and loving God, you are good, you are loving, and it's because of your loving kindness and your grace and mercy that we are here today and that we can enjoy um, our time in fellowship, our time in worship, our time in the world, Lord, as believers, as followers of Jesus, who are ambassadors of him, who reflect him, who reflect you, oh Jesus, oh God, in our world. And I pray, Lord, that the, that the words of Paul to Titus would find root, take root in our lives today. And uh, may we be reminded, Lord, when we get behind the wheel today, that um, we are meant to be people who are gentle and lowly like our Lord and Savior. 